Yesterday, Ryan and I briefly touched on the leaks from the Joe Biden team that they are actually picking Mira Tandon to serve as head of Office of Management and Budget. But there are a whole lot of other names on that list of economic advisors that both deserve just as much scrutiny, but give us the clearest glimpse yet into how exactly Biden intends on governing. And over and over again, we're seeing that he has not learned much from the last five years. Now, Tandon, in a way, is the perfect pick for Joe Biden. At her core, she embodies neoliberalism and that she's not really committed to anything ideologically except for helping herself get ahead. She's basically willing to work with anyone and anything as long as she and her cohort in Washington get to advance themselves, which is precisely the problem. Because people without principles work with and for others without principles. Take Tandon's think tank, the Center for American Progress. Sounds nice, obviously, and I'm sure you're all familiar with her very annoying Twitter account. But in between dunking, she was out there raising money from Wall Street, big banks, tech billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg, foreign governments like the United Arab Emirates, defense contractors, the healthcare industry. She took all that money to preserve her position in Washington. And now she's going to potentially run the Office of Management and Budget. And I know, look, that agency sounds really boring. But it's immensely important. OMB, as it is known in D.C., decides literally everything. They write the president's budget. They decide what gets paid for and what doesn't. They work out administration rationale for funding different agencies. They have several sub-agencies. And one of those is called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It's a snooze, I know. But let's put it this way. They write, develop, and oversee the implementation of government-wide policy around the technology industry. And to put it in even more practical terms, this is the same agency which could decide whether Uber or Lyft drivers are permanently classified as independent contractors. Tandon, a person who has cozied up to and taken money from the industry, will now be tasked with helping regulate it. Some of the people on Joe Biden's transition team in charge of staffing that agency literally work for Lyft. What they want out of the deal is pretty simple, if you can read between the lines. And to underscore just how key neoliberal economic policy is to neoconservative foreign policy, I present to you this leaked email from 2015, which shows how Tandon in 2011 justified the bombing of Libya in 2011 by saying, quote, we have a giant deficit. They have a lot of oil. If we want to continue to engage in the world, gestures like having oil rich companies partially pay us back doesn't seem crazy to me. Wow. That email is a lot scarier, considering that if confirmed, Tandon would literally be in charge of the agency that oversees the federal budget. That's just Tandon. There's another name on Biden's economic team that struck fear in my heart, though it was largely unnoticed by the mainstream media. That is a Wally Ademio. Now, the media simply stopped at his identity as a black man, but I remember him for something much more important, which is that Wally was the quote unquote senior international economic advisor to Barack Obama. So much so that Obama, after he left office, appointed him president of the Obama Foundation. But most concerning to me is that in his previous stint at the Treasury Department, he was literally the chief negotiator for the macroeconomic provisions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which you might remember as being one of the single most important things that Trump broke from economic orthodoxy on and was a disguised effort to combat China by continuing to offshore as many productive capacity that we even have left as a nation. If you're wondering where his real loyalties lie, right before he ran the Obama Foundation, he was a senior executive at BlackRock, the world's largest financial firm with $7 trillion under management. He was so high up, he served as chief of staff to CEO Larry Fink. And I get it. I know Deputy Treasury Secretary sounds boring, but this is literally the number two at the agency, and in terms of who runs the day-to-day -day operations, is far more consequential because they are tasked with actually implementing the president and secretary's policy on an administrative level. In other words, the person who helped design one of the worst trade deals ever and then went to go work on Wall Street is about to become one of the most powerful officials in economic policy. And finally, it's another figure. Brian Deese. Deese will reportedly run the National Economic Council inside the White House. That is the same position held by Larry Kudlow today. He previously served as President Obama's deputy director of the NEC, and he did a stint at the Office of Management and Budget. But more importantly, for our purposes, he's going to feel especially at home in a Joe Biden administration because guess where Deese currently works? I'm not making this up. He's a current investment executive at BlackRock 
where he apparently runs their division, which invests in more green technology. And apparently, according to friend of the show, David Dayan, he's the one who they roll out to justify their investments in fossil fuel companies and to argue that they're being more responsible. Now look, I'm not like a Green New Deal guy or anything, but it's always gross to see paid shills be paid shills. So there you have it. Near Tandon nominated to run OMB, the guy who negotiated TPP to be number two at Treasury, and a Wall Street executive paid shill to return to run the National Economic Council of Joe Biden's White House. Increasingly becoming clear, the Biden team is not just doubling that, but quadrupling down on neoliberalism and its attenuated policies. They might pretend to change somewhat in rhetoric, but as everyone who watches this show knows, Personnel is policy, and the personnel so far tell us a very specific story about what the next four years are going to look like. Next, Ryan and I discuss big business efforts to protect their interests in China. That's when Rising continues.